Hello to all of our Pleasant Green Church family and listeners. Uh, This is January the 2nd, 2022. And this is our lesson number five from our Adult Fate Pathway Study Manual. And uh, this is still Unit 2, entitled God, the Source of Justice. And our lesson, Lesson 5, is titled Undeserved Mercy. Undeserved Mercy. Uh, This is Minister Leonard Harris and... As always, it is a blessing and another opportunity for us to indulge into uh, the Word of God and to uh, gather uh, what is intended for us to receive, that it may make us better stewards of the Word and make us greater lights in the world. So, uh, our devotional reading is Psalm number 31, verses 9 through 16. And our background scripture is Genesis, the fourth chapter. And our printed passage is Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 13. And our key verse is the tenth verse of the fourth chapter of Genesis, and it reads, The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Our lesson's aims are to explore God's justice in the face of human sinfulness, reflect on the dangers of allowing sin to control us and the horrors, including murder, that can come from our thoughts and actions. And repent of thoughts and actions that could harm others and ask for God's mercy and forgiveness. And our lesson, as most of the time, divided into three different sections. And the first section is contrasting reception. Our next uh, section is a divine warning. And our last part of our lesson is gracious punishment. Gracious punishment. So we have the contrasting reception, a divine warning, and gracious punishment. Let us uh, go before the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, creator and maker of all that is, we pause for this moment just to say thank you. Thank you for all of your many wonderful works, all of the things that you have bestowed upon us because you are a God of love, mercy, and grace. All of your statutes and your judgments are pure, and we thank you that you sent your Son, Christ Jesus, of whom We celebrate it, and we thank you for that gift that was given to us in spite of ourselves that we might have eternal life. We ask that you would unfold to us the things you would have us to receive as we go through this lesson, and that, as always, we would not just hear it, but we would also live it, that we would be doers of your word and not just hearers alone. And we ask it all in the name of Christ, and for his sake we ask it. Amen. 
And uh, at the start, we want to uh, just say uh, we hope everyone had a blessed Christmas. And as always, uh, we're looking forward to another year still full of all of the fruitfulness and the blessings and opportunities that God has already given to us up to this point. And we know that although there might be some new trends and nuances, as always with the beginning of another year, we know that God remains faithful. God doesn't change. God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so uh, we will keep that in mind as we indulge into our lesson. Now, the first part of our lesson opens with contrasting reception. And as we look through verses 1 and 5, um, we read that uh, Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bared a son, the name Cain. And when she received it, she says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And then it tells us that she bare again his brother Abel. And that Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth or angry, and his countenance failed, his expression failed, his, his outer appearance changed. Now, there are... Uh, uh, some snippets of information in uh, these first five uh, scriptures here. Uh, one, we learned that Cain was the elder of the two and Abel was the younger son. And uh, we learned that they had two different professions. Uh, Cain was a farmer or an agriculturalist. Uh, he worked in the field, uh, so we learned that he was a tiller of the ground. He planted crop and reaped the harvest of what he planted. And then we learned that Abel, that uh, he was a shepherd. He had flock of sheep, and so uh, they had two different uh, uh, occupations. Uh, and another thing that we see uh, that's not actually brought out uh, in the lesson, there's no specifics uh, that give us inference into the age of the two sons. Uh, so there's no focus on uh, they were of a certain age when they provided this offering unto the Lord. Uh, also, we learned that um, there was no, like, set time. The scripture said, in the process of time, it came to pass. But um, this was not uh, a feast day, as we learn uh, further into the Le the book of Leviticus, that there were certain feasts that uh, the Hebrews had to recognize and participate in. But here we have just Cain and Abel before God had established the days of feast. But we learn that in the process of time, uh, 
we see that here it infers that there was a period of time uh, there was uh, activity that transpired uh, in the culmination of the end which produced some abundance. So in the, in the period of time that elapsed uh, from their two occupations, uh, from the beginning of Cain planting in the ground and from the beginning of Abel attending to the flock, time trans transpired uh, between these two occupations and it yielded something at the end when the activity that was practiced from the two brothers. There was a period of time that yielded an abundance. It yielded a crop. It, it brought forth a production, a product of their attending to what was given to them. And it tells us that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. But then it tells us that Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. Now in the King James, uh, it mentions that uh, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord and then it makes the comparison that, and Abel also brought. But then it says that out of the abundance of what Abel brought, that he also, because it says, and the fat thereof. So there was like an addition in the offering that Abel brought compared to the offering that Cain brought. Now, another thing here is, is that um, these uh, offerings, uh, they were not uh, designated with a specific date, uh, something that we should be mindful of is, is that from the abundance of God, the provisions that are provided to us that both Cain and Abel from the fruit thereof recognize that they should offer unto God portions of what God had blessed them with. Now, it doesn't tell us that of the intent it doesn't tell us uh, what the motive was behind the offering. But we see that obviously there was some distinction. There was uh, something that was noted that identified that one of the offerings uh, had a distinction compared to the other offering. And when we uh, look at this, uh, it doesn't reveal to us, as I said earlier, it, it doesn't uh, mention to us about what the intention was. But we can tell as we read further into the lesson that there was a distinction between the two motives are the intentions of the gifts of the offerings to the Lord. So as we uh, look into this, uh, we, we see that God favored one of the offerings, but did not 
show forth the same reception or favor to the other offering. And this caused Cain to be angry. Uh, Cain, his expression changed uh, because he recognized that God showed favor, that God showed appreciation and uh, acceptance to what Abel gave compared to what Cain gave. And when we, when we look at this, uh, Scripture does not really unveil to us uh, what were these intentions. Uh, and so we uh, kind of capsulize this and bring it home. Uh, we should think also of our own endeavors. Uh, sometimes when we bring offering to the Lord, to the house of God, or when we bring offerings from the abundance of God to our relatives, to friends, uh, to co-workers, uh, to people in need, we don't always share the intention. We don't discuss a lot of times with people our motive for why we are doing something, but people see the act. They see the end result of what we did, but they don't know what inspired us to do what we did. And so uh, scripture does not uh, uh, expose to us what was Cain's thought, what was his intentions on his gift. But when we get into the second part of our lesson, the divine warning, it begins to unveil here uh, that maybe Cain's uh, intentions, his motive, uh, maybe they were not in concert with his offering. And so as we uh, read into the second part of our lesson, uh, I will read this part from the NIV. Uh, and it reads, verses 6 and 7, it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So in the second part, the divine warning, God brings to Cain's mind, look deep within yourself. And look at your own motives and look at your own intentions. <coughs> you see, um, it's not just the outer expression or the outer act that's performed, but it is the motive and the intentions behind it. And so we see with the naked eye, we see the outer expression. We see what's being provided. But God sees the inner man and sees the inner heart and understands what the motive was behind what was done. And so therefore, the gift does not impress God as much as the inspiration that inspired us to provide or to give the gift. And God recognizes this and then offers to Cain a resolution. Says to Cain, why don't you check deep within yourself? Why are you so angry? Why has your expression changed? Um, 
Do you think that what you did was right? Um, if you feel that what you did was right, wouldn't that have been accepted? But look again at your motive. What inspired you to do this? If what inspired you to do this was not right, well then there's some other, there's some other notion behind your act that actually caused you to do what you did. And that is the notion that you must be over. That's the notion that you must rule over, which is what caused my reaction. And so, um, now what, what we recognize here is, is that although Cain was offered, he was offered a opportunity to correct what had been done. Uh, and again, in in concert with the lesson, undeserved mercy. You know, mercy is granted to us. It is a pardon for an act that we performed, but the mercy provides us a pardon for what our consequences should be based upon the act that we performed. But yet, mercy is granted in place of the punishment or the enactment of justice. And so, when we look at this and we, we see, okay, so Cain had an opportunity to, like, undo what had happened. Uh, uh, in the commentary, it says, uh, if Cain refused, then it would be because of compelling sin. God, God's point to Cain and to us is that sin can be overcome. So uh, God tried to explain to Cain that this notion that this um, impression, that, that this thought that was created in your mind, uh, he said it was like a crouching animal at the door. It hadn't crossed the threshold. We opened the door and let it in, but it hadn't crossed the threshold. It was just waiting on an entry. And then we opened the door and allowed it to come in. And once we let it in, it then wants to take control. And in this case, it is what happened to Cain. The notion, the, the uh, inference, the, uh, the suggestion, the subtle suggestion, it entered in and once it was received, it then took the driving seat. Uh, Cain became the passenger, but the sin notion, it began to drive. And look at where it took Cain. So uh, when we go to the last part of our lesson, it says gracious punishment. And let's just read through this. Uh, and then uh, I want to go back. Uh, and talk about the uh, entry of sin. But now he says, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. Now in the King James it says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field. The NIV said, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Now, mind you, this is right after God had spoken to Cain to try to give him an out. To try to give him a chance to see deeply into himself and then correct and resolve what caused him to do what he did. But in spite 
although there was spiritual instruction, there was divine wisdom that was imparted to Cain as to ourselves as well when we also let the crouching animal sitting at the threshold of the door in. But while that was overlooked, Cain then decided, Abel, why don't me and you have a talk? I got something I need to discuss with you. No, 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 let's not do it here in the house. Let's, let's go out into the field. Let's just have a one-on-one. -on -one. Let's talk to each other. And when they get out into the field, now we can see what is manifesting itself on the inner being of Cain in his mind. And now we see what was lurking in the shadows of his mind has now surfaced. And because he allowed the sin notion to enter, it then took control. And it used Cain to manifest its own evil. And therefore, Cain slew his brother Abel. And this gets even into today. A lot of the senseless killings that we witness day to day on the news and, and just all over the social media and everywhere. Um, we, we see how, uh, one word strikes someone and entices them. And the next thing we know they're in fueled and now they're enraged and they're ready to kill and destroy. And, uh, we've got counselors and psychiatrists and on and on trying to develop programs, conflict resolutions and anger management and so forth and so on uh, because we have sin unchecked. But I want us to focus on this here. It said, then the Lord saying to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And of course, Cain responded, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, mind you, uh, this was kind of sarcasm here uh, because Abel was a keeper of the sheep. He was the shepherd. So he himself was a keeper. And then Cain responds to God, well, I don't know. I'm not the keeper. Am I my brother's keeper? Uh, and the Lord says, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a, cur a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hands. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth, a vagabond. Uh, the commentary says a fugitive. That Cain thought of himself as a vagabond, a fugitive. Uh, and then Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Now, we want to contrast to this. Because remember, in the divine warning, God told Cain to check himself. Look deeply into yourself. And I wanted to read uh, out of 1 Corinthians, uh, the 10th chapter. Uh, I will begin at the 12th verse. Uh, and it reads, 1 Corinthians 10th chapter and the 12th verse. It says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. That's what God was trying to say to Cain in verse 6 and 7. He was trying to say, uh, look at yourself. Uh, I know you think you're strong and, and you're a man and, and all of this. And he's like, but you need to check yourself. Take heed, 
unless you fall. But then it goes on and it says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, in the end, 13th verse, Cain says, my punishment is more than I can bear. But just as it says in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verses 12 and 13, first of all, the, it tells us that this anger that's festering in our mind, that it's not something that is uncommon, that it's something that we are aware of. But then it goes on to tell us that even though that crouching animal that was sitting at the door, which we opened and allowed to come in, it says that there is no uh, uh, temptation that has overtaken us except that which is common to man. But God is faithful. Verses 6 and 7. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. So while at the end, Cain says that this is more than I can bear. Now, justice would say that if you have taken a life, then your life should be taken. But now what Cain is saying is, he overlooks the fact that God did not take his life for taking Abel's life, but granted unto him mercy. And although he had murdered and killed his brother, he did not kill Cain. He afforded Cain mercy. And yet, Instead of Cain saying, thank you, that I, I do deserve some punishment. I do deserve some consequences for my action. Thank you that you did not take my life. But I will have to work hard now. And everyone will know that uh, where I would be a wanderer in the earth, a vagabond, a fugitive. But instead, Cain doesn't even acknowledge the grace, the mercy that's been afforded to him. Cain still complains that, yeah, I killed Abel. But what you're doing is unbearable. I can't bear this as though God could bear him taking the life of Cain, uh, taking the life of Abel. Many times we have to look at our actions and see the pain that it must cause God. And yet God still grants us. God doesn't enforce the uh, reciprocation of what we deserve. But yet, God is kind and loving, and God allows us to understand the consequences of our actions. So, we hope and pray that something has been shared through this lesson Something's been said that helps us to recognize how we do have, uh, as a matter of fact, in the sixth chapter of Romans, the sixth chapter of Romans, verses 14 uh, through 16. In your leisure, uh, it would be uh, worthwhile to read these scriptures 
uh, because a lot of times we try and tell God that um, the sin, the the evil one uh, just overtook me. Uh, I'm powerless. Uh, I just couldn't help myself. Uh, but when God told Cain that he had the power to overcome evil, uh, in the sixth chapter of Romans, it tells us that we have dominion over sin. And it, it, it tells us that uh, if we allow ourselves to be the slaves of sin, well, then sin takes precedent over our lives. But it is because we choose to allow it to manifest itself. So again, in your leisure, uh, read those verses. And as always, uh, we hope and pray that God has given some insight in this lesson. And most importantly, that what we have received and learned, that we would not be silent of it, but that we would be doers of God's word. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.